brown, chicken brown cow. Hey, listeners, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Wisco Weekly Podcast. I am here on location in Las Vegas for NADA 2018. And specifically, I have the privilege to sit down with my guest today, Chase Fraser of Fraser McCombs Capital. Uh, Fraser McCombs Capital is a leading automotive Focus Investment Firm. They were founded in 2012. Their mission is to bring capital and mentorship to the underserved automotive startup marketplace, an area often often ignored by traditional investment firms. They look to invest in new technologies and business models within the automotive vertical. Uh, My guest today is the managing partner uh, I want to welcome Chase to the show. Chase, thank you for, seriously, thank you for your time. Um, it's It's been, a, I know you're busy out here. you got a lot of things going on, but thanks for coming on. Great to be here. I, I loved your little your little intro. What's the background on that? What's the what's the little song you do there? That's funny. Nobody's ever uh, asked that. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of just part of a, a little joke uh, of, uh, you know, inappropriately speaking. It's, you know, it's like the intro to porn music, right? It's that <laughs> bow, chicka, bow, wow. But there's a joke that goes... Uh, uh, what happens when you cross a, a, a brown chicken and a brown cow? And then the punch is brown chicken, brown cow. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's meant to serve as the introduction. Thanks for asking that. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> well, Chase, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, in preparation for this interview, I've been doing, trying to do some homework on you. Sure. I'll get to some of that in a little bit. But first off, I think the thing that I'm really most curious about is with your company, and your experience in the automotive space. Um, and it, it seems as if there, I'm led to believe that with some of the investments you've made, there's definitely a future that you are looking to help create, either for yourself or perhaps for the larger automotive community. Paint me a picture of what this world looks like to you. Yeah, I'm going to, great question. I'm going to give you two two answers. I'm going to give you a broad answer, which is about the autonomous vehicle. You know, yep. all this news about the, what's going to happen with autonomous. We're doing some autonomous investments. Um, I see a world where you've got vehicles everywhere, sooner than you think, really. Mm-hmm. I think How soon? The, how soon? You, what's you know, your projection? The, the technology is probably 90% there. Wow. I mean, obviously, you guys probably read this week with the Uber death. Yes. I mean, Unfortunately, I think there's going to be more of that short term. I did read, though, another separate headline, though, that that Uber death was not actually the um, the fault of the self-driving car. Right. Well, it's still a little bit up in the air. Yeah, right, uh, right. I, right. I think. But just going forward, it's that, you know, if the technology is 90 percent there, it's that 10 percent. And okay. that 10 percent is hard to kind of bridge. Mm-hmm. Call it five years. That it's really? it's there. Are we I, talking about level five autonomous cars here? I think the problem is not the technology. The problem is regulation. Hmm. I think feds and states are going to be nervous. I think they're going to be slow to adopt. I think you'll have uh, communities like Austin and San Francisco, which will be progressive. Yep. But it's that's going to be the process. The the it's going to be slower because of because of communities. Now, so one of the things in my eyes in terms of what the future is for autonomous cars is I believe that if there's going to be any kind of immediate adoption, I believe the first place it's going to happen is going to be within, you know, almost that, that public sector, kind mm-hmm. of, you know, where that 10% is. And specifically um, public transportation, sure. buses kind of thing, right, where there's, auto, there's already routes set for them. There's a grid that they follow, so it's a little bit easier to institute these autonomous cars. Are you, are you playing in that space yet, or is, there, you know, is, that, too, is, is that too confined um, you know, when you start going just to public autonomous cars? Yeah, we agree with you wholeheartedly. We like to, in the beginning, we like low speed autonomy. Mm. And so we just did a deal in Boston. There were some uh, really smart guys out of MIT that uh, put together a company called uh, Optimus Ride. Yep. And what they're doing is low speed shuttles. So think about a big university campus, not quite buses. You're at Disney World and instead of having the tram move you around, you've got these autonomous 
less than 20 miles an hour vehicles. But it, th that's essentially a microcosm, though, to eventually exploding it up to cities. But I mean, I, I think you also made, you know, right, you just made the analogy also to Disneyland and those shuttles. So that you could probably see that adoption taking place as well then. Without a doubt, we've got another investment in a company called Via. Uh, you know, you're familiar with that company? I, I, I read a little bit about it. Via is so cool. It's uh, some some originally some Israeli military technology. Oh. This guy is off the charts. Brilliant. You know, immediately when you say Israeli technology, you know, we're talking about uh, you know Mossad level kind of target, highly targeted kind of technology. Yeah, and originally it was it was logistics. It was moving yeah. people and things around. Well, he took that technology and picture Manhattan, if if you will, and you've got a grid, you know, east east, west, north, south, he figured out a way, what, what, I call it an above ground subway. So you've got all these suburbans running all up and down. Okay. And you say, hey, I want to go to this location. It tells you that the next suburban is going to be at this corner for 30 seconds, and it's $5 flat fee. So you walk two blocks, you're on that corner, and it takes you where you want to go. And you're in a vehicle with another Three people, four people, sometimes five people. So this is, I mean, I, I guess this is just another evolution of the ride sharing, but essentially it is combining a little bit more of, of ride sharing with shuttle public transportation because it's still a personal vehicle. You mentioned a suburban, but whatever. Sure. It could be any kind of type of car, right? Yeah. But there, the program is essentially that these cars are on designated routes, particular drop-off zone, and people are just kind of, you know, they know where to go, which is actually pretty genius because that does then minimize the friction of trying to adopt, uh, you know, trying to go from full autonomy where it's like, okay, where, where should I go? And, you know, customers kind of getting pissed off where, you know, they, they've selected an, an Uber or something and they're like, hey, pick me up over here. And oh, wait, now you're across the street. So I got to go across the street to go over there. But now this is like, okay, as long as you're in this one location, this is where we will pick you up. Right, so the transition into autonomous vehicles in that case is a no-brainer. Right. Whereas Uber's going to get there, but it's going to take some iterations. So it's much more difficult with and, Uber. And, and I think this goes back to what you were saying in terms of getting just that, that – um, a public adoption in there, right? Because then if you're trying to put a, a station on a sidewalk, I mean, you can't really do that privately. You're going to have to, you know, be in, in cahoots and partnership with the state government, city, county, whatever the case. Right. Right. And, and I like calling it an above ground subway because it's easier for a consumer to get their head around. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. At some point it's going to be autonomous, but I trust subways. I'm going to trust this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, so then with regards to the, so you invest in the following areas, dealer services and retail experience, on-demand services and fleet management, intelligent vehicle systems, financial technologies, and data, media, and predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, it, it almost seems like that encompasses the entire automotive space. Is there a particular area that you're missing or is there an area that, you know, you think eventually you'll get to, you'll, you'll want to get to? Yeah, I think for maybe the, the dealer audience, which I know that's a majority of the folks listening, can I talk a little bit about the, the dealer of the future, the dealership yeah, of absolutely. the future, which yeah. plays into your question, yeah. which is we're going to be investing in technologies that facilitate the dealer of the future. Okay. On a, on a very broad note, I think dealers ultimately are, are uh, places to have vehicles uh, distributed. So instead of having a massive lot with 300 vehicles on, on the lot, I think you may not even have a lot, potentially, that the, the manufacturer actually delivers vehicle to the showroom. You show up as the consumer to pick up your vehicle. Mm -hmm. I think quickly you're going to do what Tesla does, which is you're going to configure your vehicle online. You're going to be able to, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it takes two weeks, maybe it takes th two months, but at some point that vehicle that you configured is delivered to the dealership, in, in kind of in quotations. The, the good news for the dealer is these vehicles have gotten so sophisticated and will continue to be so sophisticated that the guy that gets hurt in all this growth is Joe's Garage. It's, it's the local guy who can't afford a $40,000 kit for the Audi A7. Uh -huh. And not only that, he's not getting trained on all the new technology that uh -huh. would be in, in an Audi, a, as an example. So the dealer of the future 
is going to be a really, really big service center. And they're going to be doing, in my opinion, a lot more service business. It's going to be, and we all know uh, for that audience, that that's very profitable gross margin business. Yeah. You'll still sell cars through a dealership. It's just going to look a lot different. What does the partnership look like between manufacturers and, the, and the, these retail dealerships? I don't think it changes much. I think in the end, the dealers still get their grosses. They're still, quote, quote, selling the mm -hmm. vehicle. But the way you communicate with the consumer changes dramatically. I think almost all of the sales, and the, I'm, I'm talking way out in the future, you know, 20 years, all, almost all the sales are done online. Yeah, where and you're you're picking up your vehicle at at the store. Let me ask you this: uh, You had mentioned uh, mentioned the the model of Tesla. So, um, it, it, I mean, and again, if uh, if you don't want to disclose this, that's fine with me. But is there a is there a a car manufacturing company you're looking to build or invest? We've looked at three or four. Problem with that whole thing is is all of them are a little bit out over their skis that. I still like the Fords and the BMWs and the Toyotas and the guys that have been doing it a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually didn't think Tesla was going to get to where he is today. H had you asked me five years ago, I would have bet against them. I I've learned not to bet against Elon in particular. I think yeah, he's, right. he's brilliant. You look at the other things he's doing in other verticals. Oh, yeah. He's arguably the Thomas Edison of, of our era. Outside of a guy like that, though... You know, Fisker's back in business. There's, there's guys that are on the periphery trying to do this. Um, no, I mean, two billion dollars later and a big maybe. No. Is uh, in in the future of automotive vehicles specifically? So let's say the the vehicles that eventually these dealerships will end up selling from the manufacturers. Is there then? I mean, do you see in twenty years that the the gas engine is gone by then, and it were we're only electric cars? I hate to say it, but yes, yeah. I think there's going to be some, think of it almost as, as the, the folks that want the stick shift. Mm -hmm. you know, people still get them, but it's not, it's really just not mass produced. I think the combustion engine almost has kind of the same trajectory mm -hmm. where at some point there just aren't many of them. Yeah. I, I think the feds, again, I've, I've brought up regulation a lot because we, we pay a, a close attention to what the government's doing. The feds are going to continue to clamp down on combustion engines. And it's a little bit of the snowball. The snowball is already kind of going down the hill. Yeah. The lobbies are so strong right now that you can't do much about it, whether it's, it's the oil lobbies or, or the automotive lobbies, uh -huh. both at a federal and the state level. But at some point, that snowball is going to be big enough where they're going to force most folks to go um, EV. And if... You read the news. I mean, all the manufacturers have got some plan right. to have a, a an electric powertrain. Yeah, yeah. Um, with regards to uh, some of these, so I, I, you know, some of the companies you've invested in so far. Um, first off, um, let, let's talk about Vroom. Mm -hmm. So, Vroom has absorbed BP. BP in a lot of ways uh, looked impressive. Um, and but it it wasn't sustainable, and a lot of the chatter out there suggests that Vroom is also in that same case. Is there something mm -hmm. you can lend towards the, that the Vroom business model that they will be more successful than BP? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I actually looked at BP. Um, oh, okay. I looked at them. We looked at them early when they were blowing and going, and were raising lots of money at outrageous valuations. Okay. Uh, we also looked at them right at the end when they were they were at bankruptcy and do, do you try to buy the assets out of out of that whole that whole process? We we passed on both. BP's fundamental problem was it was born out of the valley, okay, and they were always anti dealer from from day one and and were going to change everything. And as I walked around the room, uh, there was one car guy and there were one hundred and twenty employees, maybe huh. more at that point. Uh, it, it just wasn't going to work. Y you have to have car DNA in these deals in order for them to be successful. That's why we like the Vroom deals. I mean, th those, are, those are car guys who understand that process. Yeah. yeah recently, I'm, I'm sure you're referring to the layoffs. Uh, that actually was a, a real positive for the business. Oh, okay. Uh, they... 
just shedding some way, ex yeah. excess weight. Yeah, I think with any, all of our startups, and this is uh, for the entrepreneurs out there, maybe I shouldn't say this, but you end up wasting some of, of venture capital's money. You just don't know how much of it you're going to waste. Mm -hmm. you you got to a little bit build ahead in almost any deal that we invest in, and we're kind of okay with it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's 20% of our money. Sometimes it's less. Sometimes it's more. But that's the nature of venture. You always put a little bit more gasoline on the fire than you probably need. Mm -hmm. But that's the way you spark the growth. So that absolutely happened with Vroom. They're moving to a model now, which I love, which is profitability. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I could be completely wrong, but I don't see the BP Vroom trajectory to be even in the same stratosphere. You know, you had mentioned something with regards to uh, wasting venture capital money, and I was just watching a, um, uh, uh, a talk by Peter Thiel, mm -hmm. and he was saying how, uh, you know, he doesn't like to invest in companies anymore in San Francisco because the, um, the, the living conditions are so much that most of his money now just goes to paying for their living conditions as opposed to the company. Do you, would you share that same opinion oh, also? Yeah. yeah. The Valley is overheated. Yeah. It, it, it got overheated about 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. We'll look at deals in the Valley, but with a cautious eye, with a cautious eye for, for two reasons. One, they're too expensive. And, and two, we like kind of middle America yep. car people, guys that, that have been there and done that. Well, so, I mean, it, in terms of then the the investments, if you know if, if you're shifting geographically to a particular area, th that doesn't also mean though that the people that want to come in and invest have to also fit that mold, right? I, I presume there, in terms of uh, uh, people, companies looking to invest with you, you know, what is there a particular characteristic that you're looking for when it comes to investors? You're talking about my investors. In yes. The fund. Yes. We're current we, and current and you know and future, if you will. Yeah, we've got a unique setup where ninety five percent of our investors are from the industry, and when I say from the industry, tied to dealerships in in some way. Uh, they're they're can't name names, but we've got thirteen dealer groups, so they're they're certainly folks. Actually, some of them are listening to this so, podcast. So yeah, d dealer <laughs> principles essentially, right? Yeah, big big dealer groups. We represent a lot of stores okay. in in the fund. Um, big big vendors, uh, guys that you certainly would know their name at, here at NADA. They're they're guys that have massive presence here. Uh, we very much operate as as outsourced development for those for those companies they want us to go out and find the next the next whatever the big thing's going to be mm -hmm. specifically here at NADA since we're here talking about that and are you allowed to share some of the things that you're cooking right now yeah um I'll tell you a deal we just did that I I love um it's a company out of Israel uh, we've actually done three deals, well, two and a half deals. Kind of loving that, that, that area there. We like Israel. Uh, it's a company called Aurora Labs. And uh, going back to Tesla, I use them as an example because they do some cool stuff. They do, yep. Uh, the, the ability to do over-the-air updates. Uh, so okay. much like your cell phone setting right here, uh, it updates when it's plugged in. You know, it either hits your Wi-Fi or it's, it's uh -huh. updating you know, whenever. Tesla's do the same thing. So you're parked in the garage and, and they have over-the-air updates to, to software up, upgrades. Other manufacturers don't. I mean, as, as all, all the dealer folks on the phone know, you got to pull in, you got to throw the car up on the rack, you got to plug into the yep. LBD yep. And, and do the update that way in most cases. This company is going to allow us to do what Tesla does, which is to, to literally have over-the-air updates. Hmm. It, it's pretty incredible because uh, it can go two ways. So put, put your, your dealer hat on for a sec. Not only am I going to know that we, I, I had to put this patch or this download onto, onto this person's vehicle, I actually want to upload um, data as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to know some really interesting service data. And what I ultimately want to do with this company is be able to take that data and take it back to the dealership. So when I wake up the next morning after my vehicle has been serviced, there's a we, we've run an, uh, an algorithm, and there's I'm making this up. But there's a 93% probability that your timing belt is going to break in the next three weeks uh -huh. because we've got so much data to be able to say that that's going to happen. So I you, you wake up, I've got 
do you want me to schedule an appointment for you right now at XYZ Ford? Click here, where I can actually, I think ultimately, this data becomes the lead source for the dealer, mm-hmm. where we're driving people back into service because we're not guessing. You think about that industry, they send out service reminders, and in a lot of cases, they're guessing. Hey, we think it's time for your oil change. Hey, we think it's time for a transmission flush. I'm going to know all that You're right. via this technology. So that's that's the long ball for me. Let, let me ask you this. So, you know, on one hand, especially coming from the car business world, I understand that. I get that. I'm with that. Mm-hmm. There's another part of me, though, that I kind of cringe a bit because I'm for me, I'm I'm a. Uh, you know, my favorite amendment is the Fourth Amendment, right? It's the whole idea of the government coming in and, and spying on me. Now, this is obviously not the government, but the idea of data being logged, tracked, read by somebody else, and then almost to the point where, you know, it's like they know a little bit too much about me. Um, is, is that a, I mean, what would you tell me to quell my concerns? Because I'm certain there's other no, people it, like me. Without a doubt, that is the number one problem to what I'm talking about. It's, it's who owns the data. Starting mm-hmm. with you as the individual, is it your data? The OEMs, at least in my circles of OEMs I'm talking to, they feel like they own at least a big part of that data. Which makes and, sense. And, and through data, th- through things you've signed... <laughs> Well, that, hold on. So when you say that uh, the OEMs feel like they own it, who would be the other competitors to that? The, the dealerships and, and or the vendors? It ultimately, well, obviously the company I invested in yeah. wants oh, to have some okay. ownership okay. to that right. data, okay. right? Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's a, it's not even a battle yet, but at some point it'll be a big topic of discussion. The, the, the internal councils of the OEMs are going to have something to say a, yeah. about this. Uh, it, what I just painted for you is like the dream. Yeah. Take whatever I said, and you're going to have to make it realistic. And the, the, the reality is it will be watered down some because of privacy laws. Mm-hmm. It, it has to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I don't know, though. I mean, I, I think the one thing that was scary for me uh, was uh, last January, I flew back into the country from being abroad. And, um, you know, I'm in the immigration lines, and, you know, I had my, uh, you know, form to to check off whatever but there was all these signs that said hey download this app um, by the federal government download this app and submit all your information and there you go you can kind of go through this express checkout and I was quite surprised at how many people in line I mean we're talking about maybe seven out of ten people in line were on their phone and I I could see I was peeking over to see because I was thinking about doing it but they were easily submitting their information now Mm -hmm. I don't know what the fine print is of that app to say that you know the that app is only collecting what's there but again there's there's not gonna be a lot of people that will read the fine print so I do believe, though, there, there is going to be some portion of the future where, yeah, like, you know, I mean, everyone's tracking our phones. If you have an Alexa system in your house, I mean, I was checking out the recordings six months ago of how it was recording me. Mm-hmm. And, and that's scary, but that's also, it's becoming just, you know, an adoption that people are just, okay, this is just part of life as it is now. Well, and, and to that point, I think your, your listeners would agree with this, this comment we have to make the consumer experience at the dealership better. Right. It, it has to happen, and it's going to happen. And it's either going to be you're, you're kicking and screaming to get there, or, or some of these folks are going to go out of business. Right. So to, to make this a, a positive, you can make the consumer experience far better with this data. And so how Agreed. do you do it in a mindful way that doesn't seem big brotherish? that you walk into a store, whether you're buying a vehicle or whether you're having the vehicle serviced, but it... It, it causes you to have a better experience. That's my goal. I want consumers to have phenomenal experiences at dealerships. Let me ask you this. To that end, in the short run, in the short run of the companies that either, well, the companies you're investing in right now, which companies in the short run would have that most immediate impact on the customer experience? In the dealership? Hmm. We've got a couple, We've got an investment in a company called Keeps. I think they're doing next generation. It's almost big data ish work mm-hmm. in in uh, service departments. Okay. We think there's a lot of there should be a lot of focus in service. Everybody, 
everybody focuses on the front end and the dealer mentality is, you know, move the metal and that's where we're making money up front. I love service. Yeah. And I really love service during this next downturn mm-hmm. because just like happened in the last time, people forgot about the back end and good dealers right now are focused on service, but there's going to be more of an opportunity to do more deals in service. So I think us moving forward, you'll see us do more deals in, in fixed ops. Now, you know, that kind of leads me to another question of your background. So uh, this actually gets back way back to now the introduction and, and that being in searching you up, Chase, there's not a lot of information about you. Is that by design? Yeah. You know, I, it's so funny. I was, uh, <laughs> I was having this discussion uh, last month with somebody I'm pretty private and uh, have tried to stay off of kind of the airwaves. And with what I'm doing now, that's got to change, bluntly. Uh, we, i got to be a little bit more out there. Um, I, I want to – I believe what we're doing is incredible. I think we're, we're one of the only groups that, that invests both out in you – know, we'll call it uh, auto tech, but also focused on the dealer. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And I want to spread the gospel. I, I think this is, it's, it's fun what we're doing. I think uh, the, the word disruption is, is overused, but good gosh, there's going to be a lot of disruption in the last 15 or up for the next 15 or 20 years. Uh, I, I always had the mantra is, hey, be the quiet company, you know, be the guy that just kind of quietly makes the money over there. And mm-hmm. you got to be a little bit more vocal. So yeah. you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, we, I, I, I personally am going to have a, a bit of a, of, of a coming out party just, <laughs> <laughs> just, just to spread the brand a bit. Amen to that. A couple more questions here for you. So um, the, your, your investment firm is dubbed uh, Fraser McCombs. That's right. Uh, as I briefly looked up, uh, Fre- uh, McCombs is quite the legend. He is a legend. Um, tell me, uh, first off, uh, how did you how did you get to partner with him? Yeah, so Red, uh, he was one of my customers when when I, I had a software company. So that, just, is that just, the Market View? Yeah, Market okay. View. So we were the one of the first to do what I'm calling automated CRM and fixed ops. Okay. I uh, sold that company in 08, two months before the world fell apart. I could tell you I was, I was brilliant, but it was absolute luck. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just really good timing. But Red was going to be an investor in, in my company. So okay. that's how I originally met him. We ended up not doing a deal, but I loved hanging around the guy. He, he had his 90th birthday uh, this year. The guy's owned four sports teams, yep. pro sports teams. He's... He's a you know, legend. At, yeah, at I mean, one point, at seventy six stores. I mean, he, the, the guy's been in everything. He 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 tells a story that he's been in four hundred different uh, businesses. I read that. Yeah. So for for you know, I'm forty six. So for a guy you know half his age, getting to hang out with a legend and and really learn from the guy. He's a he's a wealth of knowledge, and and I am really lucky. To, to have Red as a partner. And so then what would be your fondest interaction with Red? I love his stories. Um, sometimes I'll sit down with him and I think it's going to be a five minute conversation and four hours later, and it's, it's, it's just stories. I mean, after 90 years, you pick up some good stories. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, Red ran hard at one point in his life. He was, he was a, he was a bit of a wild man and He's he's a kind man. He's a he's a visionary. He's still in the office every day. He uh, really wow. He, he shows up at around nine and, and leaves at about three. So uh, just prince of a man. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, Chase, look, uh, I know you got to get back to uh, your meetings over here. Um, there's actually so much more that I'm, I, I do want to discuss with you. So I hope that at some point we can get together again and, and talk more about this stuff. Um, a couple, a couple things though. Um, if somebody does want so on, on two ends, if somebody is looking to perhaps come up with the next big mm-hmm. billion dollar idea, mm-hmm. what, what? How do you advise them to get in touch with you? Yeah, and, it's, and I'm glad you asked that because some of the best ideas come from your listeners, mm-hmm. folks that are in the dealerships and like, hey, I don't like the way that's happening, or why don't why don't they do this thing a different way? 
uh, we've got uh, on our website, it's, it's, I think it's info at fmcap.com. Go to the website and yep. look at the contact us, whatever the contact us is. And shoot us your, shoot us your idea. We, uh, we end up talking to everybody. That's one of our mantras is we don't, we don't segregate. If, if there's something that comes through and says, hey, I have an idea about something, somebody from our team will, will, will have a conversation with you. Okay, awesome. Uh, specifically, it's if, it's, if, it's, if it's dealer-facing. Um, we, we think, we feel like we really know that space and, and uh, would love to see more innovative dealer technologies. Okay, so that's on one end of the spectrum. On the end of, other end of the spectrum, for, let's say, some of the... Um, the, the power folks out there, you know, your, your, your dealer principals, your general sure. managers who have been in the business, you know, they want to become a part of the magic happening at Fraser McCombs. Sure. How, do, how do they get in touch with you or what's the process like on that end? Yeah, we raise funds about every two and a half years. So we're on our second fund. We're, we're 18 months in on the second one. Okay. So we'll raise our next fund in about a year. Okay, so that's but, good. That's good but timing. Just, just because this is fresh, reach out to us. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll create a, a dialogue and, and let you know what's, what's happening and how much we're going to raise in, in, the next, in the next fund. Uh, these are good size, good size funds. But yeah, I, we... We like having dealers. As I said earlier, we've got 13 dealer groups, and I'd love in our next one for us to have 25. I mean, it's a, they give us a lot of good ideas. Yeah, right. Of course. At, we, we have our dealer breakfast tomorrow morning, and we'll be sitting around the table with some really innovative guys who, uh, who punch holes in what we're doing, but that's helpful. Oh, yeah. Well, as long as they're in partnership with you, right? I mean, those, those holes are those, you, you need guys to punch holes. Right, and circling back to the dealership of the future, that, that the comment I had earlier, that's why a lot of these guys are in it. They know their business is going to change. They just don't know how it's going to change. Yeah. And I can't specifically say for certain how it's going to change, but we want to help put technologies in front of them that help them move to whatever's going to be next. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, listeners, you can check out fmcap.com uh, and check out Fraser McCombs Capital and take a look at their website and some of the things uh, and companies they've invested in, as well as uh, con- uh, submit your ideas and, and any other information to them. Uh, Chase, thank you very much, for again, for your time and for appearing and sharing your knowledge of what the automotive uh, business and the car dealership future will look like. Um, I do hope to do this again with you because there's uh, a lot of things I'd like to get to. And hopefully the next time we do this, though, um, now there will be some information about you on the Internet that I can look up. (laughs) I promise you there will be. Excellent. All right. Uh, Listeners, thanks for tuning in. Uh, As always, please rate, review, and subscribe. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook, Wisco Weekly Pod. Uh, And thanks, thanks again. Cheers to the customer experience.